I have always been a fan of fictional games. I enjoy the storytelling in the titles and they have always been able to create a terrifying atmosphere. But the gameplay part of the games I have never really been a fan of. It always felt like going through the motions as I made progress. They were really the star of the show. That is, until Amnesia the Bunker. It feels like a backhanded compliment praising Frictional's game design when they have finally changed multiple of the core components that have been constant in their games. But even the creative director at Frictional Games agreed that it was a misstep in Soma to try to replicate the horror feel of Amnesia. It would have been better to focus on a single aspect instead. Interestingly, we made a similar misstep with Soma, where there was this persistent pressure, at least I felt throughout development, to replicate the horror feel of The Dark Descent. I think we would have made a better game if that pressure was dropped, which was somewhat remedied in safe mode. With the bunker, there's a much sharper focus. Frederick Olsen, project lead on Amnesia Bunker, was tired of the linear puzzles of Rebirth and the feedback that the game didn't really live up to the horrifying heights of the previous entry. So, from a narrower focus, a focus on horror and tension, comes Amnesia the Bunker, a rebirth after rebirth. Before I get into the game proper, sorry for the choppy frame rate in parts of the video. This game's on the edge of my PC's ability to record and play at the same time. Amnesia the Bunker is pretty simple to explain. You are stuck in the bunker with a brutal and bloodthirsty beast and you have to escape by any means necessary. The beast is a relentless and unpredictable monster, which will be listening to your every move, constantly on the lookout for its next kill, cowering the bunker. What makes spending any extended amount of time in the bunker so stressful is that the beast's behavior is completely dynamic. Gone are the monsters with limited range and scripted appearances from the old fictional titles. The beasts can appear anytime, anywhere in the bunker. There is one safe room where you can save your game and the monster can't get you if you close the door. Close the door, close the fucking door! As cozy as the safe room is, unless I want to be stuck inside this bunker indefinitely. Fighting against my immediate survival instincts, I need to step outside. Once I leave the safe room, the calming music quickly fades to make way for an anxious atmosphere, a tension that will never go away as long as I am inside the bunker, because the beast will be right there with me. The bunker trades the puzzles, the jump scares and the linearity of the other game for a much more dynamic experience. In the bunker, areas open up from the main hubs like Pope Son of Eel, and you have to explore every single part to find everything we need to get out. You need to blow the entrance open to exit the bunker, and to do that, you need dynamite, which is in the arsenal, but the arsenal doors are locked, and the entire place is under lockdown, so you need to explore other parts of the bunker to progress. We play as Henri Clement, a French soldier in World War I, who after sustaining a head injury, wakes up on a bed inside a dark deserted bunker. The bunker is a gloomy place, even when the lights are on. The dirty yellow lights aren't bright enough to thoroughly illuminate the bunker and gives the whole place a dull look, as if covered completely by dust. In other parts of the bunker where lights are white, the wooden planks used as support, the beige floors and walls give it a look devoid of colors. This isn't meant as a criticism of the visuals. The grim and marky look of the bunker works perfectly with the atmosphere that the game is trying to create. The game, even with its limited palette, manages to make different areas of the bunker look distinct. The wooden walls of maintenance with areas blocked by debris, the armory with carved walls and shelves that reach the ceiling filled with various stuff. Then the prison area with the rough stone walls that look unlivable even by World War I bunker standards. The bunker was already a rough place, and with the appearance of the beast, a one-sided war started as it carved tunnels through the whole bunker. The soldiers tried their hardest to stop it, 
by making barricades. The results can be seen throughout the bunkers as debris piles on, broken planks and loose bricks lie everywhere, and the hallways are decorated by the blood, gore, and corpses of any soldier that had the misfortune of coming across the beast. And that is if the lights are on. Pretty often, you have to explode the bunker in the dark, and if you are playing on recommended dark mode levels, it becomes impossible to see even a single foot ahead of you, as the muted colors disappear into an almost grayscale look, illuminated only by the faint dwindling glow of your flashlight. This is the place you have to explore. The things you need to progress are spread around the entire width of the bunker. A note that gives you a clue on how to progress, a quote from a dog that, that opens a locker, which has any item you need. There's something you need from every part of this place to finally be able to escape. And everywhere you go, you can hear the monster lurking by, keeping you constantly paranoid. The sound design in general works in a way that fuels a sense of paranoia. Have you ever, have you ever been in an old house? It's never quite silent. There always seems to be something going on in one corner of the place. Wood creaking, wind passing through, and noises that sound uncomfortably close to someone or something moving around. That's what the bunker sounds like in its quiet moments. There's always this uneasy feeling moving around in the bunker as every single thing you do is painfully loud. Every step you take feels like a noisy storm, the slight creak of the doors you open, the snarling of the rats every time you come near them. And if you want any amount of light without the generator on, you have to use the loud hand cranked flashlight. With each subsequent pull and every little noise you make, it becomes easier and easier for the monster to find you. Eventually, it will locate you, and the tension turns into alarm as you hear it rushing towards you. But it won't know your exact location as long as you keep the noise under control. It will move around using the tunnels trying to suss you out, and you can hear exactly where it is. Unless it goes away and stops moving. Doesn't mean the base is gone, just that you have no idea where it is now. Sometimes you need to make some noise, opening a locked door that has no key with a grenade or shooting locks open. The gunshot and explosions loudly pierce through the entire length of the bunker. Leaves a sudden ringing sound and by the time the ringing subsides, it is replaced by the many growls of the beast which knows exactly where you are. Bullets will only deter it temporarily. It will come back again, willing to shrug off more damage to get to you. The only preventive measure you have against it is trying to keep the lights on in the bunker. But that's also easier said than done. The lights are connected to a generator. A generator with a monstrous appetite for fuel. It guzzles down entire fuel canisters and uses it up within a handful of minutes. Makes you wonder how the French army didn't go bankrupt trying to keep the lights on in their bunkers. You turn the generator on, sync your pocket watch with the time remaining, and walk outside your safe space. Each tick of the watch feels more unnerving than the last as you feel the bunkers inevitable descent into darkness drawing closer. And once the fuel runs out and almost pitch blackness surrounds you, only punctuated by the beast's roar. But the lights aren't a guarantee of safety. It will only deter the monster, a sufficiently loud noise, and it will zero in on your location, making its way through the entire length of the bunker using the tunnels it has carved out in the bunker walls. The monster shares these tunnels with another one of the bunker's residents, the rats. As the game progresses, the rat infestation worsens. These rats have gained a taste for blood, 
you might want to move quickly when the lights are on so that you can explore and make some progress before the fuel runs out. But running around the bunker carelessly is unwise. The entire bunker is filled with traps. Trigger one and even if you survive the initial blast, the loud noise gave away your location. You can hide but the monster is patient and persistent and if the trap injures you even slightly, you are now bleeding and the rats will see you as their prey, whooping up at your location before finally attacking. At some point you have to explore in the dark as the generator fuel runs out. With the monster roaming and extremely limited visibility, you are forced to take every step carefully. Mistakes are even more costly in the dark as you can't rely on your vision or hope that the monster will ignore even the softest noise you make. The sense of relief when in the almost pitch black darkness you see the light from outside the safe room up ahead is immense. All the systems in the game feed into one another, forcing you to consider the trade-offs for every single action and the way you go about them. You'll never get anything for free in this game. If you want to burn corpses so that rats don't swarm on them, you are using a precious generator fuel. The same if you make Molotov. You can use cloth to make a torch or you can use it to make health items. It's these tiny decisions you always have to make, which makes this experience even more of a nightmare as the limited nature of these resources keeps you guessing whether you made the right choice. The biggest compliment I can give to Bunker is that it's an incredibly well paced cake, a well crafted and designed experience from a gameplay point of view. Sometimes the game genuinely becomes too much to handle and I mean that completely positively. According to creative director Thomas Griff, that is when they would know the game is successful. I would like to tell him that the game made me Alt F4 to desktop once cause I was so scared at one point and I know I wasn't the only one. The team at Frictional should be proud. An obvious comparison can be made. The beast's presence is somewhat similar to that of the Xenomorph from Alien Isolation. It doesn't feel as smart as the Indian but being less than a third long and an even more relentless prison makes it so that even after a full playthrough, I wasn't used to the monster's presence even a single bit. The one thing about the short length is that I couldn't use a lot of the things the game did have. I found a single stick in both my bunker playthrough, meaning torches might as well be a one-time use item. Really annoy when there's wood lying literally everywhere. And I found the lighter when I was in the final third of the game, so the Molotov I crafted set useless for most of the game. Again says me at the start that if you think it's possible, it probably is. That's not quite true. You can do some cool things, but the tools you have are pretty limited. There's no huge room for creativity beyond the basic things. Like if you try and shoot a chain open or try to blow up a flimsy looking grate, well, you will end that effort with a stupid look on your face, realizing you just wasted ammo. Bunker is a bit more open than most survival horror games, but I don't think it quite earns the immersive CMS code it has at the start. You pretty much need the designated tools to access areas, even some non-essential ones. Hell, it's not until late in the game that you can even disable traps. And you can't really set up your own traps beyond plugging in the monster's holes with explosives. I also have an issue with the game's ending, but well, let's get into the story of the bunker and talk about it. I will start off with a short spoiler free section. The bunker does a great job of making the titular bunker feel like a lived in place. All the notes, backstory surrounding the events that led to this paint a good picture of life in the place. It also effectively characterizes people like Reynard and Joubert as we can tell that everyone feared and detested Reynard who was cruel with his punishments but people like Joubert. The writing on how paranoia builds up over time in the bunker is also excellent. It starts with everyone talking about hearing scratching at the walls followed by certain soldiers hearing howling noises. 
fear keeps building up. There's already been an incident with a Roman tunnel deep below. Talks about pagan rituals, otherworldly connections, and visions. The people in the bunker are increasingly uncomfortable, and it all comes to a head when it slaughters the hated Sergeant Reynard. Reynard's death was sadistic. The level of damage done to him was impossible by a single man. Ormier launched an investigation. His rage at the incident and lashing out at the men at this happening hid a clear fear of what was going on. But the deaths continued. Soldiers were being picked off one by one, and Ormier continued his search, threatening the already scared soldiers, breeding contempt. The notes filled up a vivid image preceding Henri regaining consciousness, and the notes are wonderfully written. He manages to set up really interesting and unique situations as well. But despite all this, a problem remains. Fictional games generally do a great job of finishing their game by presenting it in a thematically coherent way, which is what makes their narratives so special. Lofty questions about human nature, like in Penumbra, or about the nature of consciousness, like in Soma. There is nothing of that kind in this game. No open-ended questions to end on. The simplicity of the story kind of makes it feel hollow. The twists are all right, but there's not much room to think about when it comes to the overall narrative of the game, especially the later parts of the game. I find it easily the weakest storytelling-wise. Spoilers ahead. From the very start of the game, we learn that something has been really bothering Henri. Some girl that has been eating at him. That soon we learned what happened. Sergeant wants me or Augustin to go. He still suspects one of us might have been with the mutineers. But I won't be going. How can I be so sure? Well, Augustin has agreed to a friendly game of chance to determine which of us it will be. And using an old sleight of hand trick, there's no... 9th of July, morning. It has been hours now, and Augustin has not returned. His luck did not hold, and neither has mine. What could I have been thinking? If he is gone forever... But I do not want to write it, for fear writing it will make it real. It was nothing. A joke. I, I thought it was just a joke. I, I never thought... I, I never thought... And therein lies my sin. Except Augustine did make it alive. Henri came out to save him, and when Henri was hurt in battle, Augustine carried him the rest of the way to safety. But Henri doesn't know that. This is where his amnesia comes into play. He doesn't remember that Augustine returned safe. And later we learn that Augustine was the beast. The hole he was lying in had magical water that transformed him. This is an extremely weak moment narratively. Why even make Augustine the monster? The beast in the bunker is a human, but it has no real human characteristics. Especially none of Augustine, who was shown to be kind and selfless, so this transformation feels like a twist for the sake of having a twist. And don't tell me about the toy. It's barely of note. I genuinely do not think the game story would lose anything if this twist was removed. The war is hell part of the theme, would still be there, Anwar's guilt is already a narratively great moment. There is no thematic depth or reason behind this twist. Maybe it's just part of trying to make something more of such a simple story. The Roman tunnel section is also kind of a letdown. Don't get me wrong, Tosar's insane speech is fucking awesome and his presence in the otherworldly tunnels makes for a great scene. But the whole place feels very short and undercooked. Its connection with greater amnesia lore is cool and all, but nothing much is actually there, and what of interest there was left me unsatisfied. Which goes for the last section as well. It's an underwhelming boss fight with the monster. It's like a puzzle from Limbo or Inside, where a blank breaks and the monster falls, or your stack boxes periodically running away from the monster. But to end on a positive note, the game does a really good job of showcasing the real-world horror of the war at point. The first time I saw the sun in this game climbing up, it was such a great feeling. Temporarily, I was free of the horrors of the bunker. 
but the illusion of safety was shattered as a sniper bullet whizzed past. And when I finally escaped from the beast, jumped outside, the German soldiers slowly surrounded me as I lied in a ditch among dead bodies. The irony would be funny if it wasn't so unfortunate. Amnesia the Bunker is a pretty good game. A bit more depth in its gameplay or a better story would have made it an all-time horror classic for me. But it's an easy recommendation for fans of the survival horror genre. Gameplay-wise, it's easily in the upper echelons of indie horror. It's an extremely tense, well-crafted experience, successful at what it sets out to do. As a fan of fictional games, I would love to see the mechanics in this game expanded and maybe even put to good use in their future story every title. I eagerly await whatever project fictional announces next.